Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Steve Macias and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. This is Andrea Schwartz with episode number 70 of the Out of the Question podcast. Today is August 9th, 2019. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Andrea. Ready for a fun conversation. Well, we have a guest today that's going to help us tackle our question, and I'm going to have Steve introduce him because they are longtime friends and colleagues. But here's our question. Should ethnicity matter? Now, I specifically chose the word ethnicity rather than race, because I believe that we are all part of the human race and the designation of race is much more Darwinian than it is biblical. Yet, the Bible does talk about different nations and peoples. Steve, introduce our guest with a little bit of his background and why we thought he would be a good participant in this discussion. Well, our guest today is the Right Reverend uh, Dr. Will Boyd. In addition to his academic credentials, having uh, multiple doctorates from the Louisiana Baptist University and a master's degree in theology from Balamont uh, Seminary, he also has uh, a unique perspective based on his life experiences. He's married to somebody who was not born in his native country. Uh, He was born here in the U.S., His wife was born outside the U.S., and they have built a family and have a whole tribe of children that reflect this diversity. I'll let him share his details about his family, how they came to know each other, and uh, what implications in the idea of ethnicity that brings to, uh, to bear with us today. Hello, Andrea. Hello, Father Steve. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing doing well. well. Wonderful, wonderful. It's good to hear your voices. I was just up there in Los Altos just a few weeks ago and uh, was able to see Father Steve. As a child, I was exposed to many of the teachings of Rush Dooney, and so I feel like uh, any time that we talk, oh, you know, we're just old friends. We've known each other forever. So I really appreciate your ministry. I appreciate what you're doing right now, and I'm definitely excited about talking through this issue of race and ethnicity. It's a sensitive topic. I know it's it needs a disclaimer. Even amongst the Christian community, people say, you know, how can one race talk about another race? And I think um, in my particular situation, and we'll talk a little bit about my story, I've I've learned the hard way how to deal uh, with various racial and ethnic and linguistic difficulties and and differences. And it's a part of my everyday life now and and one of the parts of my ministry as a missionary overseas. Okay, so if you would go into what your work is, your family makeup, how you got where you are, and then begin to share some of, as you said, your unique perspectives. Yeah, well, I come from a very typical Midwestern American background. Uh, My background is Scotch-Irish and German, and very typical for kind of the WASP population, you know, that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background. My parents had very little uh, to, to say or to teach about the issue of race or ethnicity. I was always taught that everyone was the same because God loved us all equally, and that he had a plan for everyone's life. Uh, I, was, I was never really in a situation that required me to be overly sensitive to issues of ethnicity. And I was homeschooled. My dad sent me uh, at a very early age to a Bible college, mostly from the same background. I ended up being about 18, 19 years old, and really feeling that in many ways, the culture that I grew up with was deficient, not just because it was so monocultural, but because it was uh, very much the same kind of racial, ethnic, um, enclave mentality. Later on, I found is true for almost every um, culture. But at the age of 19, I left home and I went to South India Baptist Bible College and Seminary in Tamil Nadu, India. 
And in India, uh, for two years, as I worked on a master's degree, I, I experienced the whole issue of cross-cultural, cross-racial, cross-ethnical cross um, relationships for the first time. And so it was really an interesting thing for me to experience. I feel like in many ways that was a formative experience because it allowed me to see past my own uh, self-definition of what a Christian might be. It also helped me to understand that there are different forms and expressions of Christianity. Um, all around the world, there are, there are various traditions of Christianity that have developed and helped me to understand uh, what I could learn from, from those various traditions. It also really broke me out of kind of the monoculturalism uh, of my youth, of growing up in Midwestern America. So, so in many ways, my, my background uh, was very typical of an American Protestant formation. My growth in my late teens and early 20s there in India was very non-typical. And I think that is really what formed me in my desire for missions and my desire uh, to enter the Anglican church and the Anglican tradition now really central to my entire experience as a missionary in East Asia. You know, we've been there uh, for 15 years. And so it's been a constant outflow of grace, you know, as we've tried to cross these ethnic boundaries and barriers. Well, I think it's interesting about your, your movement to, to India is that there's a different understanding of ethnic identity, right? So yeah. in India, you have people where your religion is connected to your, your ethnic identity, you know, people who have been Christians for generations, which compared to your background, uh, you know, in a Baptist home in the Midwest, yeah. you know, Christian became an identity that you, you chose or you were baptized later in life. You may have grown up in a Christian family, but your, your ethnicity and identity as a, as a Christian was somewhat detached from your religion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But then you get dropped into this Indian community where you could be set in a different caste based on your religious identity, that these two things were very much tied together. And you see that with lots of different cultures where your ethnic identity and your religious identity are sometimes merged or confused. I see that as very uh, important in my journey. When I went to India and had contact with the Martoma Christians, it was a fantastic experience because they really did shock me out of a kind of individualism. They started me along the path of thinking about what covenantal theology really means, how people groups um, interact with God. And it was an incredible experience. It was also really difficult for me to fit into the Baptist paradigms of my upbringing because we were taught that it was just a process of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And not to underplay that, that is still a very important part of what I still believe, that it is a very essential part of our, uh, of our Christian faith to have a personal relationship with Jesus. But at the same time, you know, in India, I saw people who had been really isolated from the rest of the Christian community for about 1,500 years. Um, they were used to an expression of Christianity that was in many ways much more Jewish than I had grown up uh, understanding or receiving. And in so many ways, you know, they had preserved many aspects of the early Christian culture, like the Aramaic language, um, singing of psalms for worship, um, prayers that were directly out of the Old Testament, these kinds of things that I wasn't, as a, as a non-liturgical Christian, I wasn't used to interacting with. And it was very much related to their concept of who they were as people. And I remember uh, I met a Martoma priest uh, and talked to him one day, and he said, well, you know, I'm descended from the Kohanim. You know, we're Jews, and we believed in the Messiah, and we've kept the, the Messiah's way all the way up until today. And it really shocked me because, you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of a mythic process in the West. We can't even begin to, to see that kind of continuity in our own cultures or in our own lives. And so it was, it was a real eye-opener in so many ways to be exposed uh, so early at the age of 19 to these other cultures that identified as Christian, but also identified Christianity differently than we do here in the West. So if I might interject here, I don't hear in what you're saying that somehow or other you had some sort of bad background because the people you grew up with were the people who were of the same possibly ethnic background and you hung around with people from your church. 
it sounds like you're saying the broader the broader perspective helped you tremendously in realizing that your way wasn't necessarily the only way. Absolutely. Uh, I see in my experience actually a reappropriation of my childhood upbringing. I had seriously doubted the truth claims of Christianity before I had this cross-cultural Christian experience. I equated a lot of what I grew up with to uh, really cultural decisions and, and cultural habits. And after my experience in India, I was able to see how Christ was truly universal and how many of the things that I had been brought up to appreciate were still universal, even though they might have been associated with a a Midwestern white background, ethnicity, uh, racial makeup. So what I started to see in my, in my cross-cultural experience was what truly mattered. And it reinforced the dedication of my parents and their desire to raise me as a Christian. It reinforced my grandparents' values and what they had instilled in me from childhood. It reinforced my appreciation for the Bible as God's word. It reinforced my own personal commitment to Christ. So in so many ways, it actually was hugely helpful uh, to realize that through these kinds of cross-cultural experiences. Would you say that some of those cross-cultural experiences enforced your ideas, uh, you know, strengthening a biblical sexual ethic. And you can look around at different Christianity expressions in different countries and see all of them value marriage and see the family as the, the basic institution of the faith. And they, and they see the em- emphasis on raising the next generation. You know, in American Christianity, those things are being, like you described, seen as cultural values that are parts yeah. of Americanism. But I think when we look at how Christianity has expressed itself over the last 2,000 years in you know, hundreds of countries and different cultures, there are certain ideas and values that bubble to the top as these are universal because Christ said them and they're in the scripture. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that statement that through my exposure to Indian and Middle Eastern Christianity, my understanding of the family has deepened and has been strengthened. There are no more traditional societies in the world, really, than these cultures in uh, you know, India, in places like uh, China, in places like the Middle East, where they have very, very strong commitments to the family as a very important revelation of God. It's a place where you are redeemed. It's a place where you are sanctified. It's a place where you experience God's grace in a real and new way every day. And this, I think, was really made concrete in my experience in South India because I saw such strong families. I saw husband and wives who loved each other, uh, even though they expressed it in very different ways than the egalitarian West. I saw uh, families, very large families uh, of the Christians, uh, the Malayalam speaking Christians in Kerala, uh, the you know, the huge Christian families that were incredibly happy. They were poor, but at the same time, they, you know, were dedicated to one another and they had a richness of faith and a richness of life. I really envied. And in so many ways, you know, as a 19 year old, you're starting to think about your own life and your own family. You know, I asked God, is this the place that I need to stay and live? Do I need to, you know, be a missionary, quote unquote, you know, it's funny being a missionary to those kinds of people. Do I need to learn from these people Um, and learn how to have family here. And in fact, you know, that was one of the things that I thought was very, very interesting um, as my relationships on the ground progressed, that the one way that they think of really blessing a young man and establishing him is by, you know, marrying him to, uh, you know, a good Christian girl and establishing a good Christian family. And I remember so many Indian uncles and aunties coming to me and saying, you know, oh, we've got... um, a, a niece, or we have, a, you know, a, a distant cousin um, that we would like you to consider, and it was it was a huge part of their thought process, uh, establishing families and you know creating relationships. And um, even though God didn't see fit to allow me to stay in India, and even though my wife is is not Indian, she's Chinese, um, it was an amazing thing to see how they made the church into a process of family and how that process of family really undergirded everything it was so important to them. And it's still important to me. And now as I have teenage children, it's a part of my thought process as well. How do we establish our children, not only in the faith, but in, you know, a secure family someday and how do we prepare them to be good husbands and wives? So I have a question. 
When you were in India, was the fact that you definitely did not look like them and that you had come from America, did you experience among the Christians there any sort of racial or ethnic bias against you? I didn't. And this is an interesting thing. I didn't experience from the Christian population in South India any kind of ethnic bias uh, at all. In fact, I felt very loved and accepted by them. I did, however, get my first experience of reverse racism, not from the Christian population, but from the high caste Brahmin population in South India. And I, at that time, was studying a little bit of Sanskrit. I was trying to learn more about the classical Indian culture. And I had a Sanskrit instructor who was a high caste priest. And he couldn't sit with me. Uh, he couldn't eat with me. He couldn't touch any of the things that I had touched. It was very interesting. I went to his house on several occasions, and I had to sit in the, the, the courtyard. Uh, they would put a little table, little wooden table that they kept by the side of the door, um, in the courtyard and I could sit there in the courtyard and he was three steps up removed from me under the eaves of the house. And it was funny because I knew in so many ways he knew better. He knew that there was really no reason for all of this. In fact, he was very apologetic about it, but he would explain, you know, this is expected by our people. You know, I'm, I'm very sorry about this. Um, but you know, we as Brahmins believe that foreigners are the same as untouchables and when you're amongst the Dalits, the untouchables, they believe you're the same as the Brahmins. You know, you're, you're, you're high caste instead of low caste. It was very, very interesting to see that in the Indian context and to feel that for the first time, to feel that I indeed was untouchable, that anything that I would approach or touch was somehow polluted. And that, that was really a challenge for me because I, I know that some Christian brothers um, from maybe African-American backgrounds or, you know, uh, Native American backgrounds, that they talk about similar kinds of things that they've experienced with various white people in the past. And so that, for me, was a huge reminder that this you know, knife does cut both ways, that there are, there are possibilities of racial discrimination or racial tension, and that people in their uh, unconverted state outside of Christ have no real reason to cross these racial or ethnic divides. So it was a really good reminder for me, and it was a little shocking. You know, coming from middle America, where that's just not um, a part of your normal experience, it was something new that really opened my eyes to empathize uh, with other people. Well, I think what's, what's also interesting is we're going to get into your marriage. You mentioned you married a Chinese woman. What I think is interesting about your story is not so much that you are flattening all of the races or ethnicities and distinctions and saying that Christians have no distinctions, but rather that somehow different cultures have strengths. And uh, I've seen what you've done in Chinese communities with your, with your missionary efforts. And there is something about the differences that God gives us. And there yeah. are values in those differences that God is using to glorify himself. So maybe you can tell us about your how you found your wife, the fun story with that, and, and what values you have found in different cultures that have added to your Christianity. Okay. Well, that's actually a part of this unfolding because after my experience in India, I was really moved to devote myself to international missions. I felt like when I came back at the age of 21 uh, from my experience of studying for a master's degree in India, that I had learned a lot that I had embraced the faith that I had been raised in, in a very full way, that that experience really converted me in a way because I started to see Christ as absolutely universal and absolutely as Lord and King. No longer was it just something that I kind of was dragged into. It was something that I saw as absolutely essential for my own personal life and my own vision of my future. Uh, and, you know, in so many ways, my experience with Christ in India was deepened because of the foreignness of it all. You know, when I started learning Malayalam, I remember uh, a couple songs that they taught me to sing. And I was really moved when I started to understand what these songs meant. And I remember one in particular, one of the first songs that I learned to sing in church was one about Christ being king over all, that Christ is in all and through all, that we see Christ in the good and in the bad, that we refocus our lives constantly on Christ and that Christ is, is you know, in every situation present. And, you know, those truths were taught to me since childhood, but 
in a different context, in a different language, in a different kind of cultural environment, they had real power. And it was powerful because it wasn't just the faith of a, of a white missionary who was trying to, you know, brainwash some, you know, clueless natives. It was the faith of, you know, a Christian community that is, has existed in India for 2,000 years and has kept that witness and and faith, regardless of the persecution that they've experienced, regardless of the various case issues that they experienced, regardless of um, the difficulties that they've encountered. And so for me, it was really life transforming. And it made me uh, very aware of my vocation, what I was supposed to be doing. And so I offered my life to Christ at the age of 21 uh, for full-time service and for missionary service. And I really didn't know where it was going to lead. In so many ways, I thought it was leading back to India. But I returned uh, upon graduation uh, there in, in South India back to the United States right before the week before 9-11. And when I returned back to the States, um, it just didn't, it didn't work out for me to return to India. And it was a huge disappointment. Uh, a lot of the positions that I thought would be given to me uh, were not given because of my age. Even though I had a master's degree at the age of 21, I was still kind of young and unmarried and unstable. And, you know, I think rightfully uh, you should let young men kind of work those things out and not uh, give them too much responsibility or too much authority uh, too soon, uh, you know, out of the gate. And so, you know, there was a time of testing and trial. And my dad told me that he wanted me to go and learn Bible translation. You know, I'd learned a lot of languages in India. There are 47 languages on the campus of SIBBC. I had learned a lot of different readings, a lot of different small talk and various languages. I think I had about 17 languages that I could, you know, basically, you know, uh, tease people in, even though I couldn't really speak. And so basically my dad said, that's your gift. That's what you need to do. You need to go to Bible Translation Institute. And of course, being Baptist and very conservative, he was very shy of the dynamic equivalency techniques that were being used by new tribes and taught at Wycliffe. So he decided to send me to an offshoot of Wycliffe, something that was established in 1978 by Southern and independent fundamental Baptist groups um, called Baptist Bible Translators Institute. So I was sent to Baptist Bible Translators Institute just immediately after returning from India. Um, I kind of felt like my dad was trying to get rid of me. You know, I was very upset in some, in some ways, you know, I had just come back. I was really missing my family, uh, but the semester was starting. My dad said, you know, you need to go and you need to learn Bible translation. So I went to Baptist Bible Translators Institute in Bowie, Texas, about an hour and 20 minutes outside of Dallas. And I learned an amazing amount of material on cross-cultural missions, on issues of Bible translation, on issues of Greek, many different um, pertinent issues for you know missionaries to consider, uh, maybe not become experts on, but things like you know uh, field medicine, you know how to save your life in a desperate situation, you know what to do if a snake bites you, or how to use a tourniquet, or you know how to do basic sutures, things like that. And so uh, it was like a missionary boot camp. I went through all of these various courses, and I learned a lot. And God used it to expand my vision. And at the same time, I was asking God what I should be focused on as far as a language. And I was very convicted and convinced at that time that I should learn Chinese. Uh, a lot of that has to do with my background. Uh, growing up, I was given one of the first books I ever read was the story of Hudson Taylor. A lot of the things that I focused on growing up had to do with Asia. I had met a wonderful Korean pastor at the age of eight who had given me a little Korean medallion and told me to pray for Korea and East Asia every day when I saw it. So I, I hung that over my bed and every day I would pray for Korea and his ministry there in South Korea and the rest of East Asia. So for me, it was, it was a very important thing to be involved in prayer for uh, persecuted Christians all over East Asia. And it was just a kind of a facet of my life. But I hadn't up until that time really taken learning Chinese seriously after that, I, I took it as a calling, and I started learning Chinese, and um, in a very kind of random set of situations, now that I know were providential, I met my wife in two churches. I met her in a Korean Bible study, and I met her at a uh, Chinese church, and in both of those situations, she struck me as not only being really outstanding and really focused on Christ, but she wasn't like the rest of the girls. She wasn't looking to date. And that was something that I thought was really refreshing about her because I had been 
approached by many girls in these Asian countries and, and these Asian churches, um, thinking that I was somehow looking for a girlfriend. And I think that's the common perception of white guys hanging out in Asian context that they have what they call yellow fever that, you know, that they're looking for <laughs> an Asian, an Asian wife that they're looking for that Asian wife. And so, um, I, I wasn't actually very impressed. I felt like what I'd seen in Asia, especially in the subcontinent were a lot of really loser Americans who had gone abroad to find a wife because they couldn't find anyone good at home. And so I was, I was kind of, biased against cross-cultural relationships, not because I thought that they were wrong or bad in any way, but because I'd seen a lot of really sleazy ones, uh, relationships that were based on money or green cards or other assumptions. So I wasn't really interested in that. And I had told my, my, my father previously, you know, you don't have to worry about me bringing home an Asian wife. Um, and it's really funny when you kind of lay down the gauntlet. I think that's what God does actually is he he lets us experience those things that we would least we would least choose on our own and not that in any way my relationship with my wife has been bad in any way shape or form but it definitely is a challenge and i think we need to talk about the challenges of cross cultural relationships because they're not easy at all um they're actually a calling and you have to see them as something that god is using to sanctify you Okay, so let me ask a question. Yeah. So when you met her at these two other places, was it in while you were in Texas? or you? Had- yeah, I was in Texas. I was there learning Bible translation, working hard on translating. I, I worked first on translating the Gospel of John. So I was you know, slugging it out in Greek, trying to translate the Gospel of John, trying to learn how to translate. Well, what was she Greek doing there? She was learning mathematics. She was there at the campus of the University of North Texas. And she was learning math and business. And her whole idea at that time was to be an economist. So when I met her, she was a serious student of mathematics. Uh, she was there at the campus of University of North Texas. And we met there in those campus ministries. Now, I had to drive about an hour uh, to go into church. But at that time, I was trying to learn Chinese. So you know, I was trying to expose myself as much as possible uh, to sermons in Chinese and communities of Chinese speakers. And uh, very quickly, it was apparent that I wanted to do ministry in that, in that capacity. And so uh, Pastor Teo, who is there at the Chinese Baptist Church in Denton, uh, made me the head of the student outreach. And so, you know, you get, the, you get the enthusiastic young white guy who's got a seminary degree, you know, to work for you. That's, you know, the MO of almost all pastors. And so he had me start working on that campus outreach. And Victoria, my wife, was one of the only Chinese who volunteered to be a, a part of that. So we actually started to work together in that ministry capacity. And at that time, um, the Chinese have a saying, too high to reach, that was exactly the way that I felt about her because you know she was not interested in dating. She had really no frivolous talk with me. Um, you talk about guarding your heart, man. She was absolutely razor focused, like laser focused on uh, God and his will for her life and what she wanted, you know, to experience as a, as a, as a new believer. She came from a Buddhist background, converted. Um, the first semester she came here to the United States through a Korean ministry. Um, but, you know, she had one of those life-changing experiences with Jesus Christ. And I really admired that from afar. I really admired the fact that she had that testimony, that she'd come from a, a non-typical uh, background that she had been Buddhist before she became Christian. I really admired her fervor and her desire to read the word. Um, she's the only girl that I knew at that time who carried around a Bible. <laughs> it was it was intense. And I could see that intensity in the way that she approached life and in the way that she wanted to follow after God. So for me, it was, it was really striking. And I remember telling my dad at that time, because my dad was always my, my best friend and counselor, um, I remember telling him, you know, there's this really super on fire girl on campus and I think she's, she's pretty special. And my dad immediately asked, he's like, well, what's her background? I said, well, she's Chinese. He's like, well, that might not work. <laughs> well, especially <laughs> since you said you wouldn't bring back. Yeah, exactly. Wife, so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So my mom actually immediately called me on the contradiction. She was like, you know, um, I thought you'd already said that that was, you know, out of the picture. And, you know, she was kind of laughing at me you know, her son's inconsistency. But I, I really didn't pursue the relationship. It was really interesting. For about a year, I was involved with her, um, kind of side to side, uh, doing mission and outreach with her. 
I didn't really have a lot of personal contact with her. And I, and I didn't think that she liked me. Honestly, I thought that she kind of disliked me because she was a little bit negative and sometimes a little bit reactionary to some of the kinds of things I'd say, you know, cause she was an on fire convert. She had just found the Lord a couple years before. And, you know, here's this, you know, quote unquote cradle Christian, someone who's been raised in the church um, who's a little bit lackadaisical and maybe a little bit too ph- philosophical. You know, I, I, I had the, a way of equating everything to C.S. Lewis. You know, I was constantly (laughs) trying to bring everything, you know, towards a more philosophical approach. And so that was just not what she wanted um, out of her Christian faith. She wanted real, she wanted experiential, she wanted commitment, she wanted fire. And even if you know my wife today, she's still like that. You know, God hasn't chosen to change any aspect of that personality. She is still, you know, she is still as intense as they come. But, you know, in so many ways, I now appreciate that because without her, I wouldn't be able to survive in the ministry. She has actually been my greatest teacher in the ministry that we now do amongst uh, overseas Chinese and amongst various Chinese populations. So, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing to see how God prepared all of that. I'm going to go back to something you said earlier. You said inter-ethnic marriages are not easy they're a calling. So it doesn't sound like you're saying don't do it, but it doesn't sound like you're saying go do it just to do it. Absolutely. I think a lot of people have romantic ideas of what's going to happen in an inter-ethnic marriage. Uh, This is a huge problem. In fact, uh, I've been working the last few years on a book that I call Cross Culture, Establishing an Identity in Christ, an approach for inter-ethnic marriage amongst you know, Christian young people. And I am very, very convinced that inter-ethnic marriages are some of the hardest kinds of marriages. They're not easy. Uh, all the research that people have done over, over the years since the 1960s have shown that inter-ethnic marriages actually come with their own set of difficulties, not just the man-woman thing, not just the communication thing, not just the conflict re- resolution thing, not just the power dynamic thing. You've got many layers of meaning and many layers of conflict. So even if you get along really well with your inter-ethnic spouse, you still have their family and their family isn't going to go away. In fact, in some of these cultures that are not extremely individualistic, the assumption is that when you marry in uh, to the family, you have family responsibilities and you have a family role to play. So you're not going to be able to just say, okay, you know, us Americans don't like to involve too much in, you know, financial responsibilities or, you know, family caregiving or, you know, any of these kinds of things, you know, we're just going to do our own thing. That won't work. And you'll have constant pressure. You'll have constant strife. Um, and my own life goes to prove it, not in a negative way, but just in the amount of time and energy that you have to put into the, uh, auxiliary relationships that surround the marriage. Uh, so much so that in my situation, really my entire life in ministry is defined by the clan that I've inherited. And I know that sounds very intimidating, and I think it should be intimidating. I don't think that you should get married unless you're willing to accept that kind of responsibility. And that's something you, you see not just as, as your situation, but that's a, a reality we see throughout the Bible. I mean, Absolutely. Abraham, Moses, they have this kind of clan identity. And what I think I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm, if I'm mischaracterizing this, but that the ethnic identities have real differences from culture to culture. And I think in America, uh, we have ethnicity and race so uh, you know, smashed together that people who can be the similar American ethnicity now uh, confuse interracial marriage, where people are both American, with interethnic marriage. And yeah. they, they misread what St. Paul says in Galatians and Colossians about, you know, uh, neither Greek nor Jew. And they think that these ethnic differences don't matter. And they are unwilling to, to heed St. Paul's warnings about unequal yoke and, and making sure that marriage is under a Christian foundation. And they don't take into account uh, these real differences and challenges that you're mentioning. I think you're right on. I mean, my personal experience and now my research in the area of Christian psychology, especially in marital counseling, really shows me that that's the case. And, you know, we have, we have biblical precedents for all of this. You know, when God decided to separate 
the peoples, and he made the various ethnic and racial differentiations. He did so for a very clear purpose. You know, in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel, he did so so that we wouldn't be able to get along. That was the whole point. He, he did it so that we wouldn't be able to function in that tight, intercommunicating capacity. And, you know, when you have one language, one speech, and I do think it has to do with how your brain is wired with language. Um, as a linguist, as someone who takes Bible translation and ex- exegesis very, very seriously, and as someone who's done now translation in the East Asian languages now for the last 20 years, I think that this is the core of what separates people because people operate on different programming. They literally operate on different operating systems. They think differently. It's very difficult for them to accept that other people don't think in the same way. Um, it's trying to hook up windows and a Mac, you know, without any kind of translational process, without any kind of um, intermediary programming. And what happens is very frustrating. People realize that you're not understanding, but there's no reason for you not to be able to understand. <laughs> you know, there's, there's just no acceptable excuse because people take their culture and their language for granted. They take those things as hard fact. They understand those things as being a part of the structure of reality. And so when you're trying to reach across ethnic boundaries, you're trying, you know, as the Bible uses these two words, ethnos and barbaros, um, you know, when you're trying to reach across the ethnic boundary, you have the problem of barbarianism, which is incomprehensibility. When someone can't understand you and you can't understand them, and you might even, you know, be speaking in English, but the emotions being described just don't fit any of your categories. And this is really interesting in our work in East Asia, especially in places like Thailand, um, because in the Thai community, they have categories for things that you can't even begin to imagine. You know, there's these incredible ideas that somehow being hot is bad and being cold is good. So if someone's cold hearted, it means that they're a good person. If someone's hot hearted, it means that they're a bad person. And, you know, they will use those categories in all different aspects of life. And so, you know, you'll be very, very confused when they're saying, oh, you know, you're, you're a warm hearted person. You're thinking that they're saying, oh, you're, you're a great person. Thanks. You know, uh, I appreciate you. What they're actually saying is, you know, you're a bad guy. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And it's really funny, you know, when you start translating across these various cultures it's more than just language it's a whole set of attitudes it's a whole tradition a history a language a land a law a way of life Um, these things are very very different and you can't just you know decide that they're all the same and you're going to flatten all those differences and you're going to somehow just ignore them and you're going to have a happy life that doesn't happen and i think that's one of the most naive things that i see especially in counseling uh, betwixt inter-ethnic uh, partners in a marriage, uh, inter-ethnic spouses, is the fact that they are assuming that things can be worked through easily. And the truth is, even with a lot of communication, you have to learn the other person's culture. You literally have to humble yourself to become like a little child and to submit to other ways of thinking and other definitions that are, especially for the man, this is what I see all the time. I see the woman in the relationship normally flexing to the culture of the man. And that's good. That's biblical. That's a patriarchal understanding of, you know, the, the husband as the head of the family, even as Christ is the head of the church. And I, I see that as a very good thing in many ways, you know, for the husband to be the spiritual leader in the family. But it can't happen that spiritual leaders are, are abusive they can't expect that the emotional needs of their wife are not going to be met. They have to be uh, truthfully laying down their life for their wife, even as Christ laid down his life for the church. And that's the difficulty that we see in uh, this kind of inter-ethnic marriage is that a lot of times the assumption is, you know, my culture is going to be the operative culture. You know, I'm an American, so you're going to be American. And right. that's truly not possible. It's truly not possible for the wife or for the husband to lay down their entire structural formation from childhood and assume another culture and another paradigm. There has to be flex. There has to be incarnational process where just as Christ, you know, emptied himself of all of his glory and he came to the earth in the form of a servant. So too do the people in an interracial marriage have to empty themselves of their cultural superiority, no matter how great the culture 
is that they came from, you know, no matter if they're from American or whatever. Right. It makes me think of the fact that the Bible says for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The Bible never says that the wife needs to disassociate herself from her family. It's funny that you would you would pick up on that because that's a biblical principle, but that's also a counseling principle that I see over and over is the fact that the wife has the hardest time with the reorientation process. So you end up with these men who are really strong, who are, you know, forcing, you know, my way or the highway, you know, they've got their culture and that's how it's going to stay. And the women who acquiesce to it, but they end up being doormats. They end up being walked all over the, you know, just constantly being uh, really pushed aside and not considered. And it's very, very difficult for the, for the wife to have a positive um, sanctifying experience in that kind of marriage because they're not being ministered to by their husband. And one of the things that I see constantly is, especially Americans who've married Asian wives, the husband and the relationship isn't coming into the relationship realizing that it is a process of incarnation and that he has a responsibility. He has a spiritual responsibility to remove all of that power and authority that he assumes and that he has to incarnate into this new cultural capacity. And he has to truly empathize and understand and be there for his wife and he has to wash her with the water of the word and he has to be there for her not as the you know authoritarian tyrannical head of the home but as the serving life giving head of the home and that's a completely different paradigm and especially in christian circles in conservative christian circles it's very easy for the man to have you know this wrong concept of what authority is in the family uh, rather than understanding it as serving a lot of times they'll just understand it as kind of tyrannical power. And that's not actually possible within these inter-ethnic relationships. You can't just assume that your wife's going to get with the program. A lot of times, and I've sat with couples, you know, as the wife weeps, a lot of times the wife has no idea what the husband wants. So, you know, we're going to we're gonna be a homeschooling family. We're going to be a, you know, a Bible-believing, church-going, there every time the church doors are open kind of family. And the wife... You know, she may capitulate on every issue, but she has no idea how to do the things that her husband wants her to do. And a lot of times the husband doesn't have enough patience or tolerance to teach the wife or to be there and exemplify the process with the wife. And so you end up with this incredible alienation. And this is one of the things that I think is so damaging and really destructive in the process of counseling these interracial, interethnic Christian families. So women who are abused in this kind of situation, they aren't going to associate Christ with grace or with love. Instead, they're going to see it as a law that's forced on them without comprehension. And even if the husband is attempting to be really gospel oriented, in many, many ways, it's it's damning for the family. And that's one of the real sad things that I see, especially in places like Korea, where these kinds of relationships are very common, um, is that the husband is trying trying to exemplify what he thinks is a good patriarch in the family, in the home. Um, but the wife is not properly catechized into it, not brought into it knowingly or understandingly. And so the husband forces all these various different lifestyle uh, choices. The wife isn't able to, to function. She's not able to fill the expectations, you know, meet the expectations of her husband. So it is a very difficult thing uh, that I see all the time. And from my own personal background, and I think I, I need to share more about that, this is, a, this is a real difficulty because in any interracial situation, regardless if it's a friendship, regardless if it's a marriage, regardless if it's um, a working relationship, in any one of these situations, you have to take on the other person's culture in a way. And that is a very difficult thing to do. It is not a simple process. It takes a lot of intentional struggle and intentional childishness. Uh, You know, we, we really fear being looked down upon and being seen as a child. And to learn another culture means that you put yourself in the place of a child. You ask dumb questions. You say the wrong thing. You embarrass yourself. And, you know, as especially a man, you know, with fragile ego, it's a very difficult thing to accept. You know, why should, why should I have to do that? But that's exactly what you have to do. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why all interracial relationships are so difficult, even if you're talking about a, a social 
um, experience of difficulty betwixt races. It's a very difficult situation because you have to be willing to be humbled. You're talking about this incarnational identity and one of the, the buzzwords of our day and what might be misconstrued in what you're saying is the idea of, of cultural appropriation. You know, in America, mm. it's, it's negative uh, for me to dress up like a Native American on Halloween or for me to uh, cast a white person in a, in a movie about a Middle Eastern family. You know, there's cultural appropriation. And I think what you're describing is different uh, as far as incarnational identity. But there is, I think, extremes in the other direction. You know, we, mm. we talked yeah. about this other movement where young American men become fixated over uh, you know Asian culture. Uh, I think yeah. it's called Weiboism and, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And Otaku culture, yeah. Yeah. And and there's very unhealthy senses in there where, where people begin to hate their own culture or despise their own identity and try to appropriate somebody else's for the sake of, of that culture, not really uh, for the sake of Christ or, or love. I I think that there is a very big distinction between the whole manufactured identity of contemporary identity politics and contemporary racial and ethnic studies and what we're talking about. I think this Christian worldview on which we've based all of our conversation assumes that we are all one blood, you know, as Acts says, that we are all um, a member of the human race, just as Andrea was saying earlier, that we are in God's eyes, we're all equal. And, you know, it's very important to preface everything that we do with the understanding that Jesus himself said, you know, and what was it in Matthew 8, uh, that, you know, many will come from the East and the West and they will all sit with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You know, again, in Luke, you know, when he said in Matthew, uh, Luke 13, when he's saying, you know, that there will come from all directions, East and West and North and South, and they will all sit together in the kingdom. I think, I think what we're seeing is the fact that in Christ, we do have the capacity to transcend these definitions and, and boundaries, that in Christ, we do have a new identity as new creatures in the kingdom, that we are able to have a very clear um, new identity that arises um, in the second Adam and the person of Christ himself. And so uh, in, that, in that understanding, these cultural differences are important. They give us different perspectives. They give us different uh, ways of approaching truth. They don't change the truth. They don't change the fact that Christ is the truth. Uh, they allow us to appreciate the truth from different perspectives. And I think that's very important to understand that within the Christian worldview, uh, we are not uh, equivocists. We do not believe in situational truth. We do not believe in a truth that fluctuates or, you know, this person has their truth and, you know, I have my truth. There is no such thing as identitarian truth, a truth for people of this race or that race or this sexual orientation or that sexual orientation. It is the truth, which is found in Christ, revealed completely in him and given to us through Holy Writ in the scriptures. And so we have a very different way of understanding these issues than say someone who's coming at it from a gender study or a racial studies background, who's basically associating the entirety of identity and the entirety of knowable truth with a culture or a background. And so, you know, we have a very different way of understanding these things. We are talking about absolutes that are above us as humans. Uh, they, you know, God judges us. We don't judge God. His thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways and our thoughts. And we can't even really imagine the depth and the breadth and the scope of what God has planned for us. These kinds of things are the values that a Christian worldview about race need to bring to the fore. However, in contemporary gender and identity politics, what we have is not only radical equivocation and situational ethics, not only do we have a radical departure from any kind of transcendent vision of human value or human worth, but we have this incredible undermining of the image of God in the individual by equivocating all aspects of the human person to not only the gender uh, identity uh, or the 
differences in sexual attraction, but also in the, the color of skin. And so that's one of the really strange things that you start seeing amongst uh, these hyper postmodernist uh, identitarians is that there is a very strong desire and it's a very racial, very biased kind of approach that all things basically revolve around the color of one's skin or the composite ethnic identity of one's background, um, not even focusing on the realities of linguistic differences, which are great and need to be addressed, not even focusing on the differences of, of family structure and all of the various different ways that the psyche can be formed by these different cultural amalgams of, of, of family groups. But we have this very strong culture now in the U.S., and something that's really shocking coming back from East Asia, that equates everything to race and to sex, and there is nothing else about the human person that's valuable or that can even be discussed. I think that the loss of the family as an important institution has made it so that people feel isolated and they have to find their identity somehow. Yes. And one of the, the, I mean, I remember growing up in New York and the school I went to, there were a lot of people of Italian descent, a lot of people of Irish descent. There were mm -hmm. always Irish jokes. There were always Italian jokes. And the funny thing is you could switch the ethnicity and it would be funny depending on who was telling the joke. But there were yes. real differences between Italians and Irish and German. And I think we have gotten this idea, whatever the melting pot idea is, that it's a good thing to get away from ethnic distinctions. But my husband, who comes from a, you know, English, like he, he had the same background like you did, Will, he had the greatest time when he interacted with my Italian family. Yes. He said, my gosh, it's never quiet. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and at first, he, you know, a lot of people don't know if you're around Italian family – they're yelling at each other. Oh, gee, they, they must not like each other. And I'd say, oh, no, no. With Italians, if they're not yelling at each other, then there's some <laughs> ill will between them, right? So yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with somebody of a German background wanting to marry someone of a similar background. Absolutely. I, yeah. I don't think that there's anything wrong with any of these mixes, per se. Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely struggles in each kind of relationship. And I think one of the, one of the risks that we have as, as Christians and as pastors uh, in any kind of counseling situation is that we make equivocation, you know, that we say that the individual doesn't matter, that all relationships are this way or that way. We, we make these sweeping generalities and we think that somehow that's going to help people. Actually, I think what's really important and what Christ did himself is he looked at the person, he talked to the individual it was face to face. It was very much focused on the needs that were presented. And, you know, those presenting needs formed the pastoral approach. And I think that's one of the things that we see now is that people want to have these great sweeping generalities about white people and, you know, what, what they are, you know, perceived as doing historically and maybe, you know, the way that they've oppressed people culturally. Um, these broad sweeping uh, and I could say even racist definitions are very, very dangerous because they lose the image of God in the individual. They lose the relationship that each person has with God and that we should have with one another. And yes, there are real problems. There are real difficulties. And this goes without saying, but I need to say it over and over again, especially to people who come from my background, who assume that, you know, everything is equal and everything is fine. No, there are lots and lots of difficulties for many people and many different populations. There is a perception that white Americans are uncaring, that white Americans are abusive. And I've seen that overseas. I've seen how um, disastrous uh, careless white American people can be when they're not Christian in their orientation, when they're not trying to redeem the other, when they're not trying to live according to the truths of the gospel. And so there's this re radical egalitarianism that comes with Christianity that realizes that we all are children of God. There is no distinction in the value of our souls. And even though there are cultural differences, even that, though there are dramatic differences in the way that we think, the way that we communicate, uh, the structures of our families, even even if you say that they're patriarchal families, they're very, very different in the way that they function and how work is delegated and what's expected of men and women. And all these things are culturally 
dictated. Even in the midst of all those differences, we have the faith that God loves red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight and that every person has a place in God's kingdom and that we should, as Christians, be stripping ourselves of any proud intentions or assumptions. And we should realize that because God loves all of these other people and he does accept them, even if their cultures are different, that we have to do the work that Christ did and we have to strip ourselves of our own what has been called recently imperialism, but really is just pride, have to strip ourselves of these aspects of our own human pride. And we have to submit to others in a process of becoming like a little child. That is the way that we enter the kingdom. That's how we allow others to enter the kingdom uh, is through this process of becoming like little children. And it's a very, very hard thing. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. And that's what I challenge all the men who come in for counseling, especially in these cross racial, cross ethnic kinds of situations is that is the hardest thing to do. And that will be the making or breaking of a cross racial relationship. And I think we should state that if you're born with any color skin, if we hate being white and we hate being black or we hate being various shades in between, we're basically saying God made a mistake. And I, I yes. don't think we can ever go there. And the no. truth is, I think it's an insult for someone to come up to me and say, you know, I don't see your skin color. Well, if you don't, that means you're blind. Because my, <laughs> I, when I look in the mirror, I see my skin color. And yeah. so it's, it's sort of condescending to say, you know, it doesn't really matter to me that you're black. That's okay. I don't see your blackness. Well, with my friends who have dark skin, I see their dark skin. But I don't stop at their skin because I'm looking and interacting with the person. Absolutely. And I think the one important aspect of all of this incarnational thought is the fact that God created differences, that these differences were made by God and there's a purpose. There is a very valuable component to all of the different cultural, racial, ethnic, linguistic perspectives. And that's one of the reasons why I've been pushing so hard uh, in my lectures at Torch Trinity University in, in Seoul, South Korea, um, for a an Asian summa, for an Asian theological approach that uses all of the categories that are present within East Asian thought uh, that address issues of the Bible and Christian philosophy in a way that is sincere and completely submitted to the sovereignty of God and to the inerrancy of the word and to the full revelation of God's person in Jesus Christ, but that approaches it from an East Asian perspective in a way that Westerners couldn't. And I think this is a very important thing because actually when you start talking with Asian theologians, you start realizing that the way that they understand scripture doesn't, doesn't get filtered in the same ways that we understand scripture. And this is a huge strength. Uh, Father Steve just mentioned the fact that many of the cultural categories of East Asian culture are more similar to the biblical categories. That's absolutely true. And one of the things that you'll discover is actually the Bible is revealed in, a, in an Asian context. It is a very, very different kind of book than what we think of in a Athenian, Greek, philosophical, categorical, Greco-Roman kind of overlay. It is a book about a family. It's a book about God's interaction and covenant with a group of people who have blood relationships. And those blood relationships are constantly a factor in how the story plays out and constantly a factor in how people understand their relationship to God. And then the blood covenant issue, which not only ties the family together in this um, psychosexual spiritual reality, but also the c blood covenant of the temple. And later on um, in its full revelation in Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for us. And the fact that we are one blood, not just in Adam, but in Christ, we are one blood through the blood of Christ. And we experience our salvation through the sacrifice that he gave and his work that is manifest in the shedding of his blood. These things are not typical Western categories. They're not things that we think about often in a Western cultural context. But in India, absolutely. In China, absolutely. You know, in China, they have a very strong understanding of how blood connects with life and how blood can be used sacrificially 
and so many local superstitions and elements of Taoism and elements of demon worship, all these things tie in with uh, various aspects of this blood covenant ritual kind of orientation. And I mean, honestly, if you take a villager from the furthest rem- remote inaccessible provinces of China and you tell them Old Testamental stories, they get the metaphysics. They understand what's going on. If you were to tell your typical postmodern you know, American high schooler a Bible story, they would have absolutely no clue about what was going on in the, in the Bible story and the metaphysical reality of covenant and the reason for blood and how it connects us, you know, to God and the, the life of God, you know, through this exchange. We need to be reminded of these things and we need to learn again these things from these other cultures that have these different perspectives. And I think that's what, as a theologian and as a student of philosophy, what really strikes me as so incredibly valuable about these kind of inter-ethnic, interlinguistic uh, encounters. And that's, and that's exactly what we need to keep talking about. You know, the church has always held these cultural ideas in tension, East and West, you know, Jew and Gentile. I think that's what St. Paul is talking about, that there is, a bigger picture than one culture, one dynamic. Dr. Will Boyd, uh, Bishop in the Anglican Church, uh, you're working on this book. How could we follow your work? We're, we're so thankful for your time. If you have uh, any way we can get a hold of you for our listeners, uh, please let us know. The 800 relatives that I have in a Chinese village uh, and my experience sharing the gospel and being blessed in return uh, through my cross-cultural mission and the various aspects of my psychological research later in another episode. So thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I love talking to both of you. Well, you're certainly welcome. And um, our listeners will be surprised to find out not only with your seven children and your missionary work, you sing opera in your own right. So you really are a man of many talents. But as Steve asked, is there a website? Is there some place people can go to read some of your work? Yes. Okay. So I have a lot of books available on lulu.com. You can put in my name, Will Boyd. So you can go to Lulu and look me up. Um, I also have an academia.edu site with a lot of free downloads. So you can look up my name again, Dr. William Boyd. Um, I'm there and have many uh, free documents that you can download and read for yourself. And then I have a blog. It's a little deep and people don't normally comment, um, but it's called Chinese Orthodoxy at blogspot.com. And uh, on that site, I have a lot of reflection on Eastern and Western theological perspectives in contrast. So yeah, those and can are. Can people find you on Facebook? They can find me on Facebook. I, I am very sensitive about Facebook because we work. In our Diocese of East Asia, we work in a lot of very different countries. And some of the countries are not open. Some of the countries are are hard to work within. And some of them check your media profile quite specifically. So I'm on and off of Facebook quite a lot. Um, okay. When I'm back in the States, sometimes I'll be on. Sometimes I'll, I'll be off of Facebook completely. All right. Well, thank you. And Steve, thanks for the suggestion on uh bringing your buddy here on board to have a discussion with us. And um, he said he'll come back. So we're going to have to hold him to that. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. God bless you all. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.